If I had to tag this t teaching with a title, it would simply be, I know who I am. I know who I am. I want you to open up your mouth and say that with conviction. I know who I am. One more time would be good for your soul. I know who I am. Many men aren't physically suffering from malnutrition. Some men are suffering from a lack of male nutrition because they are devoid of receiving encouragement from those of the masculine presence. And I just want to say to the audience on today that I know plenty of men who love the Lord, who have demonstrated their love for God in front of their children, bought school clothes for 18 years, made it to some plays, made it to some games, some events that their children were in. These brothers knew how to make ends meet. Some of them had to work two or three jobs to keep the lights on and the gas uh, in the car. These brothers know how to make families stay together. Some brothers had to borrow some money just to keep their family and their children in comfort and keep a roof over their heads. Some of them uh, gave all that they had to be there for their children and be there for their families. These brothers not only provided seed for their children to come into existence, but they watered that seed of their child so that their child could grow up in the Lord. Amen, somebody. And many times these men have had to deal with some expectations from some people who were overly critical of them and criticized them. Brothers, y'all not saying nothing to me on today. And they, they were criticized by people who had never walked in their shoes, never came from the same background that these brothers came from. This brother was just trying to do all he knew how to do. This brother may have not been as educated as you. This brother just tried to do the best that he could do with what he had in every now and then this brother feels so underappreciated. Sometimes he has to sit in his car and cry a tear or two because of the pressure. Somebody shout pressure. One more time, pressure. Sometimes he has to sit in his car and cry a tear or two because of the pressure that is on his life because everybody expects him to be the man. You, you call yourself a man, so just, y'all ain't helping me on the day, just be a man. And all he hears is he just got to be a man, and he's trying to be a man. He's trying to be educated. He's trying to provide for his family. But every now and then, people are overly critical of him, and sometimes the pressure of just being a man can get overwhelming. And I know that it only took four chapters in the Bible for the first murder to take place. But, uh, can I tell you on today that there's so many people who have been uh, really emotionally murdering men for far too long. And the first murder took place between two brothers. So brothers, it's time for us to stop murdering one another. Brothers, it's time for us to start lifting one another up. We know we're not perfect. We know we've made some mistakes, but can I tell you, I want every brother watching here physically and online and every father to know that you need to know who you are because if you are a father, you are somebody special in the Lord and God wants you to know who you are and watch this Feel comfortable in your identity because every day of your life, fathers, every day of your life, brothers, there's going to be a devil sent to, to try to be assigned to you, to try to call you out of your identity, to break you down, and you're going to be emotionally hurt every now and then. And sometimes your pockets are going to be hurt, but I don't want nothing to stop you from knowing who you are as a man. Somebody open up your mouth and say, I know who I am. I know who I am. I know who I am. You gotta know who you are because in this world, you're gonna 
to be broken down by somebody. Do I have a witness out there today? You're going to have some pressure on you. Watch this. After you go to your third job, it ain't going to never be enough for some people. But I want to encourage you on today. Because if you're not careful, you will listen to the negative criticism of, of yourself by other people who can't stand the likes of your face in front of them. Brothers, y'all, I'm trying to help you this morning, praise God. Somebody is going to try to rip you down. If, if you do this amount, they're going to want more. They're going to keep taking and never want to give. They, they are going to be consumers and not investors. So I just want to lift you up on the day. We find ourselves situated in this powerful Matthew text. You know Matthew, the gospel writer who gives us a powerful gospel that he penned because Matthew's emphasis, if you've read your Bibles before, is to try to reach a Jewish audience because this particular gospel gives so many Old Testament quotes from the Old Testament Hebrew Bible. What are you doing, Matthew? Matthew is trying to reach those of Hebraic nature. Matthew is trying to reach those people from the Old Testament, the Hebrews and the Jewish people, and trying to explain to those people that this Jesus truly is the Christ. So when you look at chapter number one, he begins his uh, gospel, and he tells us about the genealogy of Jesus. He traces Jesus all the way back, back down to Abraham because he's trying to show the Jews that this same Jesus is indeed the Christ and was prophesied about. And it's this same Jesus that you should know because he comes from the Hebrew Jewish people. And by the time we get to chapter 2 is where we get our Christmas sermons because uh, we know that Jesus was a child. Amen, somebody. And we find Matthew pinning that information for us. But by the time you get to chapter 3, he's establishing the fact that Jesus, somebody shout Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is beginning his earthly ministry. And before Jesus began his earthly ministry, there was a forerunner in front of him by the name of John. Somebody shout John. You know John. John the Baptist. While I'm on that, let me pause, park, and preach here for a second. Everybody needs somebody to go in front of them to pave the way for you. Brother Fleming, I thank you, man of God, because Brother Fleming went before me. And there's somebody else that went before me named Brother Baker. Amen, somebody. And somebody had to go before Brother Baker. And you got to have men that's willing to pave the way for you. Because there's some battles that I don't necessarily have to fight that's already been fought for me. And I don't know why you're looking at me with that tone of faith. Because you ain't all what you have always been cracked up to be. Somebody had to come and help you. Somebody had to pave the way for you. Somebody had to give you some hope, some encouragement to tell you you still cute, sister. To tell you, brothers, you still handsome. And I heard a preacher a long time ago that said, if you ever see a turtle on top of a fence post, there's one thing you need to know. He didn't get there by himself. And I just need you to look at your neighbors and neighbor, you didn't get there by yourself. Somebody had to help you. Somebody had to pay the way from you. And brothers, I want to tell you, Jesus had John the Baptist who was paving. He was paving the way. And then in the selected text, brothers and sisters, we find that Jesus, in verses 13 through 17, we find Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist. Could you imagine God coming to you and saying, I want you to baptize me? No, 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 really. Jesus Christ, and you know that he's the Christ, he comes to you and asks you, just John the Baptist is just a man, but this is the Messiah. And he asked John, would you baptize me? John said, I have need to be baptized by you. But Jesus said, it, it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. And then when John baptized Jesus, you saw the totality of the Godhead. Brothers and sisters, we find the Father. We find the Son being baptized. And we find the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And what I see there, I see Jesus, I see the Son's submission, the Spirit's dissension, and the Father's recognition. Amen, somebody. And when Jesus came up out of the water, the Spirit came down. When he came up, the Spirit came down. And then the Bible says that there was a voice saying, Behold, this is my Beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There
there is nothing better than having a father who identifies with you in relationship and will say that you are his son. And he said that I am well pleased. So Jesus' father was pleased with him because Jesus' baptism proves that he was going to go ahead with the mission to die for the sins of humanity. So we find the entire Godhead present there. And there's a powerful notion, brothers, for those of you, because Father's Day is different from everybody. Because everybody's situation is different. And everybody's relationship with a parent or a father could be different. And we want the ideal model, but I know it's, it's different for everybody because when I look back at my own life, man, I wish, I wish that my father was still here. Yes. And I want to speak to those right now who may have not had a great relationship with your father. I want to speak to those who don't have a father in your life anymore because your father uh, is gone on. Irregardless of whatever relationship you have with that father, can I tell you something? If your father could be here right now, they would be proud of you. Can I say that one more time? I believe every father who sees their child, that's me and you, doing well on this earth, irregardless of whether they're no longer here or not, I believe they would be proud of you. And I don't know about you, but I'm representing my father. He not here no more. He's gone on to be with the Lord. But he has a son down here in the pulpit telling me and women, boys and girls about this man named Jesus. And I just believe that every saint that has known me, that has gone on to glory, has, has, has knocked or a, a pushed the doorbell on my daddy's mansion and told my daddy what his boy is down here doing. I don't know about you, but if you got a parent that's a father up in glory and you know they're looking down on you, proud of you, you ought to open up your mouth and say, thank God I know who I am. Thank God I know who I am. You represent your father while you're living. Amen, somebody. Oh, let me move on. So, so now I need you to know uh, succinctly that the fruits of your fatherhood are determined by the demonstration of faith in your manhood. The fruits of your fatherhood are determined by the faith of your manhood. So in other words, if you want to have your children as being holy fruit, you have to demonstrate uh, and model godliness in your manhood. So I need you to know by the time you get to chapter number four, I want you to know what's already taking place. This is going to bless your life on this morning. Stay with me, church. So what Jesus does is he gets baptized. In other words, he has what you call a public coronation. The father has said, this is my beloved son. So we know that Jesus is definitely God's son. We also know that God was pleased in Jesus. But the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 1, I want you to notice this now. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be, let me read it one more time. Uh, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the pandemic to be tested uh, by the devil. Let me read it one more time. Then Jesus, after he just got baptized, somebody said baptized. He just got baptized, Brother Fleming, but notice what happened after he just got baptized. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit, where? Into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Spirit himself didn't tempt Jesus. The Spirit led him to a place where the devil would tempt him. I want you to understand that though. In other words, I want you to catch this now. Jesus was in preparation for his destination. So the spirit led him into the wilderness, wilderness to experience temptation. I want you to notice that this is going to bless your life. Because I, what I want to do is establish the fact that we need to uplift our fathers. But I need every father in here and every man to know who you are. Because there's going to be some devils in your life that's going to try to stop your identity 
from being what God says your identity is. Right, right. Yeah. Because there are going to be some people who going to tell you you're not good enough. Right. You don't know enough. You're not educated enough. Right. You haven't done enough. And the more you try, the harder and harder it gets. And I want you to know who you are. So when the devil sends those people, you'll be able to look at the smile and say, I know who I am. Amen. I know who I am. Amen, somebody. So now watch this now. So even Jesus had to get prepared for his destiny. Even though he was sinless and never ever sinned before, God through Holy Spirit knew that Jesus needed to be prepared for what he was going to have to go through so that you and I could be saved. So he allowed him to be tempted by the devil, the tempter in the wilderness in the moment where he had a public coronation. He ended up having a private interrogation. The moment God said, this is my son, the devil comes up and says, if you were the son of God. Can you see that? The moment God identified that this same Jesus who came up out of the water after he was baptized is truly the son of God, the devil comes with, with a... Uh, Conditional conjunction. He says, if, somebody shout if. Yeah. If you are the son of God. What is, he, what is the devil doing? He's trying to play a subtle trick with Jesus' identity. And there are going to be some people in your life that's going to question your identity. And watch this church folk. Question your relationship with the father. <laughs> But can I tell you, I want you to notice this now. Now look at Matthew chapter 4, and let's look at verse uh, number 2. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, you know, 40, the number 40 is significant uh, in biblical uh, text because 40 deals with strife. A period of testing uh, in your life. I don't have time to take you back to the Old Testament, but you know 40 is a significant number where so many things happen uh, in the Bible with the number 40. Uh, jo God sent Jonah to preach to the Ninevites and said, I'm going to destroy this place in 40 days. Moses was up with God for 40 days. David ruled as king for 40 days. Years It rained with Noah for 40 days. Jesus, once he had his ascension and stepped up on the cloud, had taught his disciples that he was resurrected for 40 days. So we see Jesus fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Then the Bible says he then became hungry. Now I want you to notice this, brothers, because what I want to do right now is really just try to help you because I want you to... Uh, maximize your masculinity and your potential. But let me just tell you what's going to happen. To, what happened to Jesus will happen to all of us. And the Bible says he then became hungry. He was hungry after 40 days of fasting. He didn't eat church for 40 days and 40 nights because in the process of fasting he was clearing himself of his fleshly desires and focusing on God. So when you fast, your strength comes from God because you get away from your fleshly desires. That's going to be important in just a moment. But isn't it interesting that the devil did not come to him at the beginning of the first few days? The devil came to him after 40 days. Isn't it interesting that the devil will come at you at your weakest point? You just bought two more tires. Now you got an engine problem. You just fixed one leak. I ain't got no help in here today. You, you just got beyond one massive argument with your spouse. And now something else didn't. And you go around talking about, man, child, the devil is busy. Yeah, he busy, but God is even busier. Because God is responding to not only your request, but every other Christian's. Uh, request out there even on today. So I need you to know this powerful information that anytime you have a public coronation you will always end up having a private interrogation. So we know that after 40 days and 40 uh, nights Jesus was fasting and the Bible says in verse number 3 and the tempter came and said to him 
if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. In other words, in verse number four says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live, this is the verse you know, on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Here's what Jesus did when the devil came for him after he was hungry and weak. The devil tried to play on Jesus, catch this, physical appetite. Let's say it together. Physical appetite. One more time. If you're online, just type it in, physical appetite. The devil tried to play on his physical appetite because he knew that Jesus was hungry and he had to eat in 40 days and in 40 nights. If you're not careful, brothers, the devil will do the same thing to you. Even though, watch this now, here's what Jesus has to do. Jesus rebuked Satan with scripture. I want you to get this now because this is going to bless everybody. He said, now watch this, Jesus sent him into the wilderness to be tempted so he can build up his strength for what he was going to have to go through. And, and watch this, the devil challenged his identity. Okay, let me come home. You ain't no man. Brothers, you ever had that ring in your spirit before? Because somebody said that you want a man because there was something that you failed to do. There was an expectation that you did not come good on. And somebody sp spoke that into your spirit and it bothered you so much. Because people will try to challenge your identity and your manhood. Amen. So do I have a witness in here, brother? Just wave your hand like you in a parade, brothers, and you know what I'm talking about. Okay, I got about okay. Okay, about 30 of y'all in here today that's honest with me. Let's see if I can get the rest of you in a minute. But I just need you to know, but notice what Jesus says. It, is, it was God's will for him to be tested. So what Jesus does is quote Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse number 3 from the Old Testament. It's a passage where the children of Israel were in the wilderness. And what he's saying is that God allowed those people to be hungry because God wanted to test them to see whether or not they were truly following God. And what Jesus does is he denies his flesh so that he can come good on the will of God. And can I tell you, every day of your life, brothers and sisters in this place, you're going to have something that's going to come at you and come at your physical appetite. And you can't be the man that God wants to, 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 to have you to be if you always give in to your physical appetite. Because here's what Jesus says, man does not live, shall not live, come on somebody, on bread alone. See, it's not just about satisfying your flesh. Notice what Jesus says, but on every word, somebody shout every word, Okay, you want to know how you need to be living? You want to know how to deal with your mind? You want to know how to deal with all those negative thoughts that come at you as a man or a woman, as a child of God? You got to know how to live. So you're living on what people say about you. You're living on what somebody said about you that was negative 10 years ago, and you ain't spoke to them at church since. Because you still have that in your mind. Because it messed with you. Can I tell you, Jesus models for us. Don't worry about that. My job is to go through this process because God is working on me. Does anybody in this place know that God is still working on you? And God is working on me. And he's working on him and working on her. God is still working. So Jesus says, God does not want me, even though I have the power as the son of God to command these stones to be made bread, even though I have the power, I'm not going to do it because God will is for me to be tested and to make sure I don't give in to my physical appetite. And brothers, if you're not careful, you will mess up your relationships. You know, y'all know I'm not scared. Brothers, you will mess up your relationship with your, your significant other or your wife giving in to the flesh. Oh, Brother Fleming, are you praying for me today? It's quiet through here. Because every day you're going to be challenged. Your physical appetite is going to be challenged. But he says, man shall not live on bread alone. Watch this. Here's how men live. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth 
of God. So if you want to know how to live, can I tell some of y'all how you made it through the pandemic? It was because of every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. Yeah, yeah. Though he slay me, amen somebody, I will still trust in him. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And we know God calls us all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God said you got to live based on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So I don't go by what some past girlfriend said about me. I don't go by what the supervisor at work said about me. I don't live by the compliments. See, if you live by the compliments, you'll die by the criticism. And the criticism is going to come, brothers and sisters. So that's why we live by the word of God. We get our strength from God's word. We get our marching orders based on what the word of God says. Look at your neighbor and say, I live by God's word. Go ahead. I live by God's word. Not by my fleshly appetite. Let me move on. Because I need somebody to know the devil wants you to satisfy your flesh. Watch this. He wants you to satisfy your flesh apart from God's will. And all of us have done it. And when you satisfy your flesh beyond God, apart from God's will, then you're going to have what I call block blessings. <laughs> you're going to have blocked blessings. Anybody here want to be blessed? You're already blessed, but if you want to be more blessed, anybody here want to be more blessed? Okay, you have to go by God's will instead of yours. Because here's the mistake we make. God, if you get me out of this one. I'll give online, I give on tithely, I mail in a contribution, I'll be here on Sunday, I'll be here on this day, I'll be online on Wednesday, and God bless you. So in other words, you were all about your will, watch this, till you needed God. Then you said, God is all about your will, then he blessed you, then you went back to your will. And what what Jesus helps us understand is we have to live. I want you to, in all seriousness, you have to live by God's word. I'm living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If it's not in this book, I ain't living by it. And there's a lot of folk that's walking around physically alive but spiritually dead. And you think you're living, but you're not even really living because you're not living by God's word. It's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Amen, somebody. The second thing we find is personal ambition. Three things that will hold you up, brothers, in your, in your plight as a man and as a father is your physical appetite because that's what the devil is coming after. He's also coming after your personal uh, ambition. Notice Matthew chapter 4. And verse number five, I want you to catch this this morning. Uh, the Bible says, then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, questioning his identity, identity, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command the angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. What the devil does is quote... See, the devil know more Bible than some of our members. He quoted Psalm 91, 11 and 12, and left out the part that says, in your ways. Re referring to God's ways. Amen, somebody. In other words, here's what, here's what the devil tried to do with Christ that we can learn from, brothers and sisters. He tried to take Christ to a high place so that he could get recognized. Okay, let me come home. So he could have all the hype. Okay, so he could have the drip. So he could be noticed for his greatness and his goodness. In other words, the devil will play on your personal ambition. Because he said, Jesus, why don't you go and 
on the top of the temple and stand there and throw yourself down because you know the Bible says, and let me just tell you something, the devil knows how to throw in some slick stuff and twist the Bible around. He's basically doing the same thing that he did to Eve in, in Genesis chapter 3. Because since Eve didn't know the word correctly, the devil ch changed the word just a little bit. And, and what he was really saying was, Jesus, you ought to let people know who you are because they already expect you to come in this grandiose fashion when you reveal yourself as the Messiah to the people. So why don't you just go ahead and do that? So in other words, here's what the devil wants from all of us, particularly our fathers on today. He wants you to get engrossed into personal ambition. Make it all about you. Don't have time for your kids. Don't have time to bring them up in church. That's why I love to see these brothers with their children on the day. Amen, somebody that's bringing their kids to hear the word of the Lord. But the devil does not want you to take part of that. He tried to do the same thing with Jesus. And notice what Jesus did. He quoted scripture. I don't have time, but he quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, and verse uh, number 16. And Jesus said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, Jesus said, don't you test me. And, and, and Jesus, watch this, he rebuked Satan with scripture. That's why it's hard to live right if you don't know no scripture. In other words, if you don't know no scripture, anybody can speak into your spirit. And, and you may even start believing it. Some of us are, are, are Google theologians. Some, some of us are Google academicians. We have masters at Google. Let me see what Google say. But you don't even know who wrote that stuff. Somebody that don't even know the word of God, just put their opinion out there. Be careful with who you get information from. And, and, and so we find that the devil will play on your physical appetite and your personal ambition. I think it's good to go places and go on vacations and love on your family and be the man that God wants you to be. It makes no sense to have everything down here but not be prepared and prepare your family for heaven. So though you can have personal ambitions and there's nothing wrong with that, but when you put, watch this, and this is what Jesus helps us understand. When you put your personal ambition, watch this, come here, lean in church, before God's will, that's a problem. So in other words, if, if you can go everywhere else, <laughs> but can't be here on Sunday, I, I, just, I just kept Brother Jones online today, y'all. I got to finish cooking this morning. And you, you, you know my favorite team. My favorite team play at 12, so I don't want to be late watching the game, so I just I just catch a Newberg online. Oh, y'all quiet. Sister Jones, are you praying for me this morning? Don't put your personal ambition before the will of God. Because let me tell you what God will do to us, and I, I will tell you, he's done it to me before. Anybody ever felt like you kept going in circles in your life? Anybody ever felt like you kept experiencing the same problem, the same issue with the same person at school and at work, and you, you made up your mind you had a bad attitude with them, and you let them have it, and you said, Lord, have mercy. Please forgive me, Lord. I sin. I repent. I'm going to do better. And Monday came. And they were cutting up, acting crazy, trying to get you fired, trying to get you in trouble. And you said, you know what? I ain't going to do what the Bible said. I'm going to do what Brian C. Jones said. And your personal ambition came before. Watch this, the will of God. And you know what God has to do when that happens, church? Allow you to go through the same thing. <laughs> because you didn't learn from the test. He can't move you and elevate you until you pass the test. Look at the person close to you and say, it's just a test. Go ahead, it's just a test. It's just a test. It's just a test. See, you're a child of God. And watch this. God expects more from you than he does with people who are not in relationship with him. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God wants to put your spiritual behavior on display for the world so the world can ask you, how do you behave that way when you're going through all hell in your life? And then you can tell them, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. Amen, somebody out of the mouth of God. So at some point in your life, you're going to be tested. Anybody been tested before? Not just for Corona, praise God. I'm talking about 
tested spiritually, some people on your job and some folk in your family and some people on your vacation. You was out there trying to get a tan, sisters. And for you sisters who was trying to just already got a tan like me, praise God, you was just trying to jump into the swimming pool and somebody was acting crazy with you in the swimming pool. Anybody ever tried to jump before you in line to try to get some groceries? And you almost lost your Christianity. Hold on, I, I, I was here first, please. Excuse me, excuse me. And all these, it took all the scriptures you knew not to let that person have it. Because you were already running late and then got to get some gas before you get to your destination. And it took all the scriptures you knew. Oh Lord, let me move on. So you're going to be tested. But I feel a James anointing in me on this morning. James says, consider it all joy. <laughs> My brethren, when you encounter various trials, watch this, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. So in other words, when you go through stuff in your life, just know that it's just a test of your faith. It's a faith test. And if you flunk the faith test as a child of God, a Christian, God has to put you in what I call remedial classes. Amen. And give you the same test again so you can pass it with flying colors. Then God can elevate you to the next place of your life. Give God some glory in this place. It's just a test. It's just a test. It's just a faith test. Pass your test, brothers and sisters. And the last thing you find is the attraction to power. <laughs> Brothers, I'm just trying to help you on this morning to know who you are. You are a child of God, and if you're going to be blessed the way God wants to bless you and your children and your family, you got to make sure you understand how the devil will come at you. Because I felt like this is may, may not be your more traditional uh, Father's Day message, but I thought to myself, I just feel like we need to encourage the fathers, but also in, in the encouragement, help the fathers understand what you're up against. Because I don't never want the fathers to leave Christ or leave the church or get so frustrated by being so underappreciated. Because I, can I can tell you, every man in here has felt unappreciated within the last month or two. And you know why? Because you feel like you're doing so much already, but not being appreciated. Do I have a witness in this place? You're trying your heart, you're trying to improve. You're trying to be the man that God wants you to be, but it just seems like you get put down time and time. I ain't got no help. And time again. At some point, somebody going to have to lift you up and tell you you need to know who you are and you're somebody as a father because if you are a father, God has given you a powerful designation and you need to be uplifted. Yeah, see, we're not accustomed. See, we're accustomed to doing this for mama. Right, right, right. We do backflip for mama. Well. But, you know, that's daddy over there. That's what he's supposed to do. He the man. That's what he's supposed to do. Well. Just let him sit up on the couch. Don't ever say that to him, but just go over there. Oh, let me move on. Um, so, so the third thing that, that Jesus was faced with is this, uh, what I call power attraction. Here's what the devil did, and I'm going to show you what he wants from you. Give you a few more points and we'll, we'll shut it down on today. Notice verse number 8 of Matthew 4. Again. Now, once the devil come at you, brothers, he's coming at you again. This is the third time after he had eaten in 40 days, 40 nights, and being tempted and tested, all right? Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and their glory. And he said to him, now notice what the devil said to the Son of God. All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Okay. The devil is the God of this world. Don't have time. 2 Corinthians 4 4. And he has blinded the eyes of and the minds of people in this world. He is the God of this world. I wish I had time, but Ephesians 2, 2 talks about it uh, as well. But you need to know, the devil asked, told Jesus, if you fall down to worship me, I give you all these kingdoms. In other words, all these wicked people that were following the devil, 
The devil says, I'll just let you have them. They'd be under your control. But there's one thing you got to do. Two things. Fall down and worship me. Can I tell everybody this? And this may be shocking. The devil not just only wants you, he wants you to worship him. We say, Brother Jones, I've never worshipped the devil. Really? Really? When you were in control of a spirit that was not holy, when you were not under control of the Holy Spirit, you and I were under control of some demonic spirits. Anybody remember being out there wild? Showing up. See, this is what happens when you get church folk in dresses and suits. Brother Jones, I don't know what you're talking about. Sister, five years ago. Brothers, two years ago. Brother bro, Jones, I really don't know what you're talking about. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll, I'll be back in a minute. You were under the control of a spirit that was controlling you to do what the devil wanted you to do. Because the devil wanted you to die away from Christ. Die outside of Christ and his church. Because the devil knows that he is going to be burning in a lake of fire and brimstone when Jesus comes back. Or when you go to eternity. So he already knows where his eternal destination is going to be. He's trying to get some followers. So in other words, God and the devil both want folk to worship them. So the question is, who are you going to worship? And when you idolize, watch this, money over God, personal, physical appetite over God, can I just say this real quick? This is going to be real. Young people, come here. Stay a virgin. Y'all not even used to a preacher saying stuff like this. Young people, keep your virginity. That is the sexiest thing you could do. Because if you mess around and make that first mistake, which many of us already have, it could lead your life down the wrong path. And there's always two paths in life. The right way and the wrong way. But the devil is pressuring you to do it. He sends a little boy to your dorm room. He sends a brother to slide into your inbox. Your DMs, they been somebody. And they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. I just want you to know that you need to know how the devil operates because he's coming at you. And if you give into your flesh, you end up sometimes practicing idolatry because you put money, your fleshy desires, and what you want before God. So therefore you end up worshiping the devil and don't even realize it. If you are one that places everything before your worship, because there's nothing like worshiping God. Because when, when you worship God, when, when your spirit and God's spirit kiss, your mind is on God. And, and your mind is on his spirit. And you have a spiritual connection that nobody else can explain. But you, because you know how you connected with God in that moment in time when you were worshiping him. And what God wants for us is worship. The best thing every brother could do is bring his family to church. Amen. The best thing a brother could do is to be in submission to God. Amen. Brothers, she'll submit to you when you're under submission to God. Amen. And you've got to give her a brother that is under submission because when you're under submission to God, then that is a mission that the sisters can submit to. Because the undergirding of the word submission is the word mission. Everybody shout mission, mission. I'm teaching you on the day. The word mission. And every father, every brother who has a child should be striving 
striving, I want to encourage you on the day, should be striving to have a mission to get your family to heaven. That's what it's all about. Listen, if you go to every game, if you buy them all the dresses and the clothes and the suits and all that stuff, but if you never tell them about Jesus, then they can be out there worshiping an idol God. And so the, the best thing we can do is tell our children about Jesus. I want to stop right here, Paul, and commend every father who's trying to tell your children about Jesus. Put your hands together right now for every father in this place that have tried their hardest to tell their children about Jesus. Thank you. So he comes at us. And Jesus has to quote Deuteronomy 10, 20. But I want you to know that in every situation, Jesus gives an Old Testament quote. He rebukes the devil through scripture to help him understand that he is in total submission to God's way, God's word, and God's will. And that's what I want to tell you on today. Make sure you do all you can to be in submission. Somebody shout submission. submission. To God's word. God's way and God's will. Otherwise, you will be in opposition of that and that can hurt your relationship with God. And notice what happened in verse number 11 and I'm done. Notice your Bible. Then the devil left him. Isn't that exciting? Then the devil left him and behold, watch this. The angels came and began to minister. Listen, if Jesus needed somebody to minister to him. If Jesus needed somebody to minister to him after the devil came at him three times. What do you think our fathers need? <laughs> we need to be serving and ministering to men and our fathers because every day they try to do their hardest, many of them, but they fall short every now and then and they get disrespected all the time and not even appreciated for all they're trying to do. So what we need to do is make sure we make it a perpetual practice in this place and this church to minister to our fathers. Can we say that together too? Minister to our fathers. Okay, we got to minister to our fathers. All right, I'm done on today. I want to just say to every father, we just want to encourage you on today because you have a tough plight. You've tried to raise children. You did, many of you did the best that you, had, that you could, and it's a very difficult time. Try to, raise, try to raise children in a pandemic? And the school thing is messed up, the church thing is messed up, and everything is online, it's a different way to learn. I mean, kids have been struggling. And we got to do our best to repair that which has been broken. But first of all, we got to lift up our fathers. So let me just tell you this. Fatherhood is not about how many women you sleep with. How much money you have. Or who you have power over. Fatherhood is about who you submit to. How much faith you have. And who has the power over you. See, manhood is all about being holy and spiritual and getting your family together uh, and to heaven. So I want to just ask right now, if every father in this place could stand right now, every father in this place, I want you to stand. Just the fathers, just the fathers. Matter, matter of fact, every man stand. Every man, every man. Now, if you're in the same household with that man, I want you to lay hands on him right now. Just touch him, just touch him, just touch him. If you're in the same household, you came here together because every man, even yesterday, me and my wife were traveling, we were driving, and I had a, a couple of days ago, I had a massive headache, and, and it felt so good to, to have a wife that when I didn't have enough strength to pray, that she could just touch me and lay hands on me and pray over me. Say, God bless this man, I love him. Bless him to feel better. You're strong. You are a warrior. I love you. This church loves you. But God loves you more. Don't let your mistakes you've made before in the past cause you not to know who you are as a father and a man. You need to know that God thinks so much of you that he gave you seed so he can produce more of you. You are somebody in Christ. You are somebody in God. I'm going to pray for you right now. God bless these brothers. 
Bless these faithful men. Bless these leaders of households. Bless them to be encouraged. Help us minister to men all the time, not just on Father's Day. Lord, thank you for their love, their energy, their effort, their resilience, their tenacity, their love for their children and their, their wives and their families, oh God. Many of them have made mistakes like we always have. Many of them are still learning on the job and getting on the job training. Help them be reminded of who they are, knowing that when you say you are in relationship with them, that you are really in relationship with them and they're your child, oh God. Help them lead their families to heaven, lead their children to heaven. Help them grow to learn from other men about the best thing to do in terms of becoming a godly man. Watch over them, protect them, strengthen them, give them all they need when they need it and for what they need it for. Father, help us celebrate them, not just today, but every day. Be with them. May they provide spiritual encouragement for their families and this church and lead their households in such a way that magnifies you and gives you glory, honor, and praise. Lord, we salute these brothers. Keep them, all of us, and bless us in a special way to glorify you and do your will. Bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Let's give God some glory for these brothers in this place. make this short and sweet. If you're here today, you need to know that because of the mistake of the first Adam, everybody dies. But because of the intent of the second Adam, everybody lives. And the second Adam is Jesus. So Jesus made up for what the first Adam messed up on. And here's what Jesus says. Because you, you can't be a godly man until you surrender to Christ. Amen. So if you're a young man, young boy, teenager, young adult, elderly man, elderly man, older man, why don't you make today your day when you say, I'm going to live for Jesus? Or if you're a woman or anybody in this place, it, you simply need to decide today that you want to give your life to Jesus. You, you want to be baptized because you want all your mistakes gone. All your mistakes washed away. We had a baptism online on last week. There was a sister that was watching online. So if you're online right now, please hear me. Um, all you have to do is believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is indeed the resurrected Savior. Believe that Jesus Christ is your God and that God sent him to die for your sins. Be willing to repent of your sins. Confess Christ and be willing to be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Brothers, if you've made some mistakes before, that's why God sent Jesus. So you, he could die for you so you can be forgiven of your mistakes. And so we want you to give your heart, give your life, give the, give the rest of your life to Jesus. And young sister, young brother, uh, older sister, older brother, whoever you are, wherever you are today, you can simply just decide that you're gonna give your life to Jesus. Um, I don't know if this song has already been selected, but we're going to sing a song to encourage you right now. We want you to know who you are in Christ Jesus, but this is a time for you to make the decision to really say from this day forward, I surrender all to Jesus right now. Let us all stand, let us all stand, let us all stand. We want just those who desire to be baptized, man, woman, boy, or girl. You get the courage right now. You walk down these aisles. And you give us your hand and we'll baptize you today because you want to get forgiven of all of your mistakes and be a child of God. 